I mean, I don't know, first step to know was completely new? Or? Okay, yeah. And then I always have to balance a little bit yeah. what we're going to talk about. So before we start, we do a few prayers. And even before we start the prayer, it's always important to generate correct motivation. Yeah, as a, uh, it's not only a Buddhist thing, but just on a secular or universal way as well. Whatever the outcome of our actions depends a lot about motivation. So that's why it's important to generate correct motivation. So we can either have a kind of, for those who do not consider themselves as Buddhist, kind of universal motivation, try to change the mind uh, in order to you know, become better human beings and <laughs> for the for a particular purpose, not only for the happiness for oneself, but also try to achieve others to you know, accomplish those aims in life we all strive for, right? Wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. So that can be kind of universal motivation, and then those who are already a bit more into Buddhism, they can either motivate themselves for, you know, to compress human rebirth, liberation, and enlightenment. Right? So it's based on the same principle of um, if you cannot benefit others, then at least try not to harm others. Right? So uh, that's one aspect of our motivation. And then the further we can extend it to the benefits of self and others in a very constructive way on the long term, then uh, that can be uh, yeah can be of more benefits. So that's why maybe just for yourself, uh, just for half a minute or so minutes, just reflect the motivation why you're here. Yeah, and then think you know to change the mind for the benefit of self and others. So generate the motivation for yourself. All right, so then we do a few prayers. Um, a little prayer book, starting on page number five. So, so prayers we do for a particular purpose. Yeah, we're gonna do a praise to Sakyamuni Buddha, and why is that so? Because not merely to venerate uh, an individual like that, but we see the qualifications or the qualities of the mind of the Buddha, and by understanding those qualifications and thinking how wonderful it would be if you can become yourself like that. So that's why, basically, we do prayers, right? To for that purpose. So we start on page number five, a little prayer booklet. To the founder, the down to the destroyer, the one who comes beyond, the one destroyer, the complete, perfect, full awakened being, perfect and not as she ever come out, the God that knows the world, the supreme guiding and the human being, each of God's and the beings, to you, the complete, the fully awakened being, the down to the destroyer, the glorious conqueror, subdued from the sucking bed. To the founder of the transcendent story, the complete perfect the to the founder and transcend and destroy it, the one going beyond the world, or destroy it, and complete it, and put it away from being, perfect in knowledge and good conduct, and out of the world, being guided by human beings to protect it, each of God's human beings, to you, and complete and put away from one, and out of transcend and destroy it, and out of the world, and out of the world, and out of when no supreme among the humans came upon the whole earth, you played out as a strong and then sent out to you in this world. To you, O God, I am prostrate. The pure world is more to me than you, with emotion like the world of mountains. Fame that lays in the three worlds, when of the best world is the most prostrate. The supreme science, fed by the spot of the moon, color like gold, to you, O God. Thus, to you, like you, the three worlds are not, in the power of wise God, to you, O God. The saving of the great profession, the founder of the world, the center, the field of the merit, caused by the powers of the nation, to the one comes the dust and the rest of the purity that frees from the passion and the virtue that frees from the lower realms, 
the one heart is not a pure reality, the one heart is not a pure reality, the one heart is those who are liberated to show the past liberation of liberation, the only way to follow back the realization, who are devoted to the more precepts to you to supply the means of the new version of prosperity. How much to the speed would I have brought to the power of the How much to the power of the power of the power of the power to all the world, the respect is bounded by this, this many is all around us, and it's in the last place. We pay that by homage. Do not commit any new purchase actions, nor on group purchase actions. So do your mind to work on this situation of the world. The star of the world is playing by the land, and the real ship drop of the new world bubble. The dream of flash of lightning, the clouds, the exhibit of sheets, and such such. To this merit, may all send you being to take the rank of all seeing, to see the rank of all seeing, and the deliverance of the Sarah Ocean, to the other way to the age of sickness and death. And Hartsford, right next to the pitch. Thus did I have heard one time the Bhagavan was the brother of the Sarah Ocean's mountain, and right here, together with the great community of the monks, and the great community of the Sarah at that time, the Bhagavan was a goal of all concentration, and the first of the Bhagavan was a goal of all perfection. Also at that time, the first of the Mahasattva Aryabhan was a goal of looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom, and because of that, I beg it is also a time to give the nature of the nature. Then he took the power of the Lord of the Lord, and 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 the Lord of the Lord. How should any son of the nature 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 of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Lord said, I'm not sad, 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 i am not sad i am not sad i am not sad i am not sad i am Sharapurusha likewise is all the known entities with our characteristics and beliefs and seeds, and even the top of that stain and the competition is not fulfilled. Sharapurusha therefore in the end is to form the power of free dealing, discrimination, and composition practice, and consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no vision, no form, no sound, no order of taxes, no particular fashion of the world. There is no island, no soul, no tyranny, freely, no mind element, and no never much consciousness. There is no ignorance, no intention of ignorance, and so on, not to include the major and identity and the state of the state of the Similar, there is no separate for your nation's cessation of the world. There is no result of wisdom, no attainment, no sense of integrity. Sharon, who is at that world, who does no attainment, or the sufferers who rely on the world of action of his wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of Nirvana. All the Buddhas is drawn in three times, also manifested completely in the way from the world as possible, perfect, complete enlightenment, alliance with perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of the great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the only world, the mantra that perfects our souls of suffering, the mantra of the truth is not false, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Diana, the Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Shadow of the Kutra, or the Sassar Master of Arihara, and his brother, and the Osano, and the entire people, along with the Bhagavan, 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 the Bhagavan. A prostrate to the gathering of the Dhakas and the three chakras, who abide in the Holy Yoga of using space. By the four powers of the clairvoyance and mental imagination, look at the precious light of the Bhagavan, the Bhagavan, the Bhagavan. Samara says, Nasa Samaraya Pin, Tayata, Gata Gata, Paragata, or the Samara Bodhisattva. By the teachings of the three Sri 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 Sri
may it be dispersed, and may it be pacified, and may it be completely dispersed. May all negative forces of those who are be completely pacified, and may the hopes of nature to us of those who are pacified. May we be separated from problems and harmful conditions of time. In short, Mandala, page 16. <laughs> So actually that summarizes also the topic for today. <laughs> so that means that uh, you moved out of compassion. So this is a little bit of the history of the Buddha, right? That the Buddha, as you know, was born in, in very kind of yeah, good living conditions, so to say, as, as being a prince and you know, have all the wealth and, and, and needs that you like to have in life who are present. But still, it didn't really give him the ultimate satisfaction. Yeah, so, and not only didn't give him the ultimate satisfaction, but he saw all kinds of things in life when he went out of the palace, so to say, you know, difficulties in life people are facing. Yeah. And then generally summarized in, in the suffering of birth, sickness, aging, and death. Yeah, and that's either four rivers of the sufferings, so to say. Or in early, yeah, even during life, we have difficulties is also pinpointed down that we don't really meet the things we like to meet and we have to do things we don't really like to do, <laughs> you know, and never really satisfied. Yeah, so that's kind of a summary of what the Buddha saw and then went into a spiritual practice. Yeah, so for us, very similar that, you know, we enter in spirituality for a particular purpose. So what is the purpose? Sometimes it's just mere interest and for some people it's a bit more kind of, uh, you know, they engage a little bit more in the sense of training the mind in order to achieve more happiness, right? So, why? Because that's the aims in our life. Yeah? So it's two, uh, we have two aims in life, right? Wanting happiness and not wanting suffering. Yeah? So that aim exists in all, all of us. Yeah? As soon as we wake up in the morning and we have a headache or a cold, the first mind that arises is to, to take something to get rid of the headache, right? Or to, yeah to get rid of it, so we don't like suffering. Yeah, that's kind of innate uh, thing we all have. You know. And then if you have a little bit, uh, if you wake up and you have a good dream or something like that, and a little bit of happiness is there, you want to keep it. You know. So that proves that we have this kind of innate wish for happiness and not wanting suffering. Yeah. So the Buddha also examined that, and then the next question was how you can accomplish that. Right. So that's what the Buddha actually uh, went uh, 
in search, it's pretty much search, and then came to the conclusion that it's not the external factors that are the main causes for happiness and, you know, uh, pre for prevention of suffering, but actually it comes from the mind, because happiness is a feeling, which is kind of mental activity, right? And that depends on the mind. Yeah? And yeah, we can relate to that in our day-to-day -day life. And even people who go on world trips, for example, get some money, you know, and then, uh, you know, we all did that, I think, in our time when we were students. And uh, I remember when I was a student, I hitchhiked across Europe. And I remember I also hitchhiked from London to Edinburgh and back. And we had a two-week kind of period, and one day only we had sunshine. So it's very <laughs> 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 So that's my expectation because I lived like more than two decades in, in South India. It is a climate average of 25 degrees and, you know, sun. So then I have this view I'm going to the UK and then expect this kind of weather. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so based on, 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 on seeing that even people will go on world trips, then you can see you go to one place, you get bored, you go to another place, you get bored. You know, I mean, not totally bored, but you want to have something more exciting to see something else than what you already saw for so long time. So uh, you keep going, you keep moving to different areas or different countries. And then actually, uh, sometimes people come to the inside that it's not the place they're going to that's the problem, but it's the mind. Because the mind, if you don't change your mind, but you change the external conditions, but your mind goes with you wherever you go, right? So if you don't change your mind, but you only change external conditions, then that's what we call, there's no satisfaction. There's no really achievement of, of the real happiness. Well, if you look more internally and do kind of, you know, the trip of the mind, so to say, then they can be more achieved. You know? So that's, the Buddha also came to that same conclusion. You know? And then, uh, having seen the causes where we're going to talk about today, yeah. what are the causes for suffering and what are the causes for happiness, and then in relation with the two, uh, two truths, and that maybe in relation with the Four Noble Truths, because His Holiness Dalai Lama always says, in order to understand the Buddhist aspect of mind training or the Buddhist aspect of the part, without the two truths is very difficult. And without understanding the two truths, it's very difficult to understand the four truths. And that's the basic teaching of the Buddha, right? So the first teaching the Buddha gave in Sarnath after achieving enlightenment was actually the four noble truths, yeah. the principle, yeah. the fundamental teaching. So then, yeah, the Buddha saw this and then came to the conclusion that it's not external factors that actually is the real cause for happiness, right? So then it's a kind of mental development and came to that conclusion and then saw that what is suffering, right? So then the Buddha examined what kind of sufferings we have. He just summarized a few, yeah, birth, sickness, aging, death, you know, and then meeting conditions you don't like to meet and never meeting the conditions you like to meet and never being satisfied. Yeah. So that aspect of never being satisfied that even been realized by people you know, who sung song, songs about it, even in the UK, I think. You too was UK based or not? Yeah. Uh, I haven't found what I'm looking for. <laughs> the Rolling Stones, really. I can get no satisfaction. So there's many, even pop stars who came forward to similar kind of uh, conclusions. Yeah. So also the Buddha saw that and then saw what is the, what what is this actually this kind of suffering yeah, so we can do the different types of suffering of, of the physical ones of the mental ones we can relate to yeah and then and then the buddha said this is suffering right so that should be uh, known you should know suffering so that's very different kind of levels of suffering yeah, we talk about the suffering of suffering the suffering of change yeah, it's also another category of pervasive compounded form of suffering yeah so but to summarize and the Buddha said, as long as you have the cause of suffering present, which is the next noble truth, yeah? so first you have a problem, and then you have to analyze the problem, right? Or you have a sickness, and you have to analyze. So that's why you, if you have a sickness, you analyze, go to a doctor and see what's wrong. And then the next step is, of course, checking the cause of the particular problem. Yeah. So the Buddha, in many ways, is, uh, yeah, as long as Dalai Lama actually often refers to the Buddha as a, as a scientist, right? He's kind of explain the science of the mind. Yeah. So that means the Buddha understood how our mind actually functions. Yeah. So the mind and the, the, how the mind functions is kind of cause and effect relationships of different states of mind. Right? So this cause and effect relationships, as we sometimes call karma, 
within the continuity of a consciousness of a particular person as many aspects. Right? So one aspect of that is this kind of that the cause. What is the cause for suffering? Is what the Buddha pinpointed down is kind of destructive emotions or afflictions. Yeah. So these destructive emotions or afflictions like anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, anxiety, more modern you know, afflictions in modern society, anxiety, depression, fear, you know, they actually disturb our, our mind. Right? So the Buddha came down to seeing that's the cause. So first he said, what is suffering? And pinpointed down the different types of suffering of body and mind. Yeah. And there's more kind of profound aspects, but you start simple. And then he explains the cause of these kind of sufferings, right? So that's, technically speaking, we say the afflictions and karma. Right, in, in the Buddhist context, but uh, to simplify it, uh, we, we talk about the destructive emotions, right? Anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, anxiety, fear, you know, that actually disturbs our mind. Yeah. So, and uh, the Buddha saw that. So he saw that actually is a cause for suffering, these destructive emotions. Yeah. So then the Buddha said you should know suffering and should abandon the cause of suffering. Because if you abandon or give up or eliminate the cause of suffering and suffering will not come into being. Right? This cause and effect relationship. Yeah. So, so that's uh, the Buddha thought. Yeah. So, uh, and then if you same, you go to a doctor, you have a sickness, analyze the sickness. Then next step, what is the cause of the sickness? Right? You check, you analyze. So, uh, same thing. So the Buddha analyzed and saw actually these destructive emotions together with karma, this kind of activity yeah. based on destructive emotions, we act physically or verbally. So, uh, even taking a destructive emotion like anger as an example, if you get irritated with a particular person or situation, maybe only for just for a few minutes, but hours of our day is just is just gone, you know, <laughs> it's just destroyed. You know? So that's just only the mental aspect. Right? Then on top of an aversion like anger, there's also the possibility of saying something wrong to a person, right? In a kind of not very constructive conversation, so to say. So in that context also you might have said something wrong and then uh, you disturb the other minds in the mind of the other person and then even you start to worry about it. You know, I did something wrong, I shouldn't have said this. So on top of being agitated then you have these worries about I shouldn't have done this, right? So that means that just a few minutes of this, you know, this destructive emotion, irritation or anger actually causes us a lot to suffer. Yeah, that's just a simple example. Then, yeah, even on a social level in, in society, same thing. People who commit acts of, of, of you know, criminals or acts of murder or rape whatsoever <coughs> is grounded in these destructive emotions, right? Yeah, so one of my friends, we used to give talks in the, in the central prison in, in Bangalore. And uh, our translator, who translates into the local language in Canada, he is there for murder, so he's there already for 40 years. You know. So, uh, think a murderer, but actually he's a very nice person, right? If you didn't know he committed a crime of murder, but if you just meet him, you never expect he killed a person, right? But he told me once, he, he said also, I was for 10, 15 minutes, I was not in control, I made a mistake. So that's a kind of emotional hijack, as we call it, right? That the person is not in control in, in, in particular uh, periods, and per period of time, and acts actually physically. Right? And the cause cause kind of a lot of disturbance. So the Buddha saw that, you know, that these destructive emotions together with their actions, yeah. so we say afflictions and karma, actually cause suffering. Because my friend in prison being, you know, just not in control for a few minutes caused him to, to stay there for fourteen years now, right? Mm -hmm. With the conditions in the in the central prison in Bangalore is not like in the West. I don't know in the UK prisons, but definitely not like the, the ones in the Netherlands. Everybody had their own room and TV, and it's like, you know, <laughs> the people in the prison in the Netherlands, they had much better conditions than we used to have down in the monastery in South India. <laughs> 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 I think, but, uh, yeah. but still, they locked up, you know, but yeah, anyway. So that's, you can see that these destructive emotions actually cause a lot of trouble on the individual level, but also on on the social uh, scale in society. Right? So that's why these movements of emotional intelligence and subduing your mind and, uh, became very popular because it seems to work. That's a lot of kind of pilot projects done with uh, Daniel Coleman, yeah, who writes a lot about those kind of issues that uh, in schools 
in the kind of colleges, universities, different fields in, in, in companies, even some departments of the New York police force, they trained all of these pilot projects to see what, what's all about these destructive emotions and constructive emotions and how we can deal, yeah? Because in the early days people thought, if you're very intelligent, you know, if you're a very intelligent person, you get a good education, you get a good job, and that's, that's a good life, you know? But actually they came to the conclusion that only intelligent is not enough. Right? You have to know how, because we have to deal with people all the time, right? So we have to know about our inner world and also know the mind of others. Yeah? So that's why this movement of emotional intelligence became very popular, because it seems to work. Yeah? If you know how your own mind functions, you know how to relate to another person. Yeah. These people who are isolated or people who don't know their own mind, it's very difficult to have a good social life. You know? People who are not aware of their own kind of emotions, it's very difficult to have a feeling for others. Yeah. So that's what they say, these kind of criminals who continue to engage in these kind of acts, meaning their own mind, they, they're not really aware of what's going on. You know? Feeling they don't know. And they so that's, yeah, that's why, uh, yeah. so the Buddha, came to that conclusion that what actually are the destructive emotions and what are the constructive ones. So we analyzed that. You know? And then came to the conclusion that the cause for all our suffering are these kind of destructive emotions together with the actions or the karma as we say, right? Afflictions and karma being the cause for suffering. You know? So same thing, we have a sickness and examine the cause of the sickness. So next is we have to understand if it is possible to get rid of these destructive emotions. If not, then we're just wasting our time. We might as well go somewhere else in Leeds and, you know, try to enjoy life, <laughs> so to say. But, uh, you know, it's possible to eliminate these destructive emotions. Yeah, the Buddha saw that, otherwise he would never progress on this spot. Same if you go to a doctor, you have a sickness, you know, the, you ask the next question, the cause of the sickness. So you know the nature of the sickness, you know the cause of the sickness, Next question is, is it possible to get cured, right? Because if you don't possible to get cured, then you're wasting your time. Yeah. I mean, to a certain extent, yeah? So, so here, same thing. So the Buddha said, okay, is it possible to achieve a state when there is no destructive emotions present, right? There's a question. Yeah. So the Buddha examined that and saw that actually it's possible with different reasons. Because we're not all the time angry, right? Take anger as an example, it was a destructive emotion. And it's, uh, anger is not an innate part of our mind, right? It's not always present, right? I hope people are not angry at the moment. So, so that means it's not always present, you know? So that means it's only temporary. It comes by the power of some external conditions. You hear something, you see something, right? We think about something. And then get agitation comes, right? So that means that they're not always present, and they're not an innate part of the mind, you know, like, like the sky in, in Leeds at the moment. It's kind of, it's obscuring the blue sky, right? But the blue sky is still behind the clouds. You know? So that means that the clouds themselves are not an innate part of the blue sky, right? It changes, the weather changes, right? Maybe I don't know the forecast, but maybe over a few days, sunshine comes again, right? So that means that the blue sky is still there. Yeah, just temporarily it obscured yeah, the, the, to, from us from seeing the blue sky. So our destructive emotions are very similar. They're just temporarily there and they prevent us from seeing our true nature of the mind. Right? So that's like the sky being obscured by, by, by uh, the clouds. And sometimes the clouds are more grayish or white, sometimes they're dark, you know. So same for our mind, yeah, it's like uh, it varies, you know. So that the Buddha saw also, okay, these destructive emotions are the cause for suffering. They're not always present. They're not an inner part of the mind. And they're changeable, because our mind is changeable, right? You yeah. can change the mind. Yeah, people can change. Yeah. So uh, the Buddha examined that, and also examined that these destructive emotions are not in accordance with reality. Yeah. All these kind of anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, that fear and anxiety, very strong examples that they project something of reality which is not true. Yeah. With, with anger or agitation, irritation, you see the faults of the situation or the person, right? And you don't like to see the qualities. Even if another person pats you on the shoulder and says, no, no, come on, this person is not that bad, you know? Also did this well and this, you know? 
has this kind of good qualifications, they said, no, no, not true. Because when your mind is agitated, you don't like to think about the good things <laughs> of somebody else, right? So you can see that this anger actually is not according to reality, because it only sees the faults of a particular object, right? So that's not a reason that they can be taken away if you have more constructive forms of consciousness that understand your reality, right? So that's a few aspects uh, of that, that the Buddha saw, that, that there's a possibility of doing so, because most of these destructive emotions, even to certain psychiatrists, they come to the conclusion that 80 to 90 percent of what, how we perceive things when destructive emotion takes over is just mental fabrications. Yeah? So over imputing things. Right? So with, with anger, we, we say, oh, this person is bad, this situation is bad because of this, 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 this. We use certain type of reasoning, but that reasoning is not very logical. It's only focused upon one aspect, right? So that's anger, right? And anger wants to be separated from its object. Yeah, that's another aspect. Yeah, well, well, attachment is the other, goes in a complete different direction. Because attachment only likes to see the qualities of its object. Yeah, it doesn't like to see the faults. You know? uh, so, for example, you order you know, a meal on, on your app. You know, I think it leads the same thing, right? Yeah. You can. <laughs> it is and you look at the picture, like a nice pizza or something, whatsoever. And it looks very nice on the picture, but then when it arrives, it's different. It doesn't look like a picture, right? So then if you look at a picture, you know, oh, wow, this is amazing. Then, you know, you, 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 attachment takes over and has a lot of expectations. Yeah, about, oh, this, if I get this pizza or this meal, that would be, that bring me happiness, you know? But actually, when it arrives, then expectations are not met. Why are they not met? Because you over-impute qualities by just merely seeing it and say, oh, if I have this, so tasty with this temperature and you know but it's all not true right so we overestimate the qualities it actually doesn't have right? so that's not in accordance with reality and then when those expectations are not met there's no satisfaction right? so that's why uh, the rolling stones also came to a similar conclusion <laughs> less profound i think but uh, you know they came to the same conclusion that there is no sense. Why is there no satisfaction? Because as long as these destructive emotions are playing a role in our continuum, are playing a role in our decision making, then there's no real satisfaction to be gained, right? Same with this people who are doing this road trip, they have such expectations. If I go there, I'll be so happy. If I go there, I'll be so happy. But then they go somewhere, expectation is not met, so they go somewhere else. And expectation is not met, so go somewhere else. So that means that. As long as these destructive emotions are motivating us, then there's no real satisfaction to be found in life. Right? So that's with all these kind of destructive emotions we just mentioned. So the Buddha saw that that's not in accordance with reality. So all this, they're very sneaky though, those destructive emotions, because they, they like us to believe, if I get this pizza, I will be happy. Right? They like to believe. Or a new car, or a new iPhone, or a new, you know, whatever. You, know, that's, you can see that these destructive emotions, how they actually, there's a very, I always often use an example. Uh, yeah, now I don't know, but you know, the Apple iPhones, they're very expensive kind of fancy phones. But I remember, I was once in, I didn't watch the news that often when I was in the, living in the monastery. And especially the last the year when I was in Kumitanto College, it was a very intense kind of program, and, and you're just busy with other things and the news, right? So then I came in contact with, uh, with people from Jamyang, and they emailed me a little bit about the situation in the UK and Brexit this, Brexit that. And I thought, what is Brexit? So, <laughs> so I had to do a Google search to find out. You know? But anyway, so, so then back to the, the phone. So there was an iPhone 4, I remember, many years ago. There was one shop in China with this iPhone 4 was one of the first shops who were going to sell it. And people had already these expectations, right? I'm going to buy this phone at 9 o'clock in the morning at that day at that shop because it's the first one. You know, so then they thought, I need this phone, right? So then they were lining up in front of the shop before 9, of course, but then the shop didn't open at 9. You know? So that means that the people who had these expectations based on attachment, right? their expectation was not met, and then the other aspect of attachment is if you separate it from your, from your object, you feel uncomfortable, right? 
So that happened here also, and that turned into kind of aversion because the object was not met at nine o'clock, and then later on, I think ten or something, opened. But the shop couldn't open because before they opened the shop, they tried to were they throwing stones at the window shield of the shop because they needed this phone. Now <laughs> nine o'clock, <laughs> yeah. so we can see that actually how this kind of structural emotion actually people act. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually, there's a few things to see that. They're not in contrast with reality, they can be abandoned, right, as the Buddha said. And they're not an inner part of the mind, and the moment they are changing. Yeah? So then the Buddha came to the conclusion, okay, it's possible. Yeah? So the doctor said, okay, if you have a sickness, it's possible to get cured, right? So then you know that, you know, that's what we call uh, the truth of cessation. I mean, it's very simplified, I'll explain it now. It's kind of the possibility to be free of it. Right? So then the next question is, how? So with the doctor, same thing. First, you have a problem, or you have a suffering. Then you have the cause of the suffering, right? After having known the cause of the suffering, then the third one is the possibility of to be free of this kind of problem or not. Right? So that's what we call true cessation. In a very simplified way. So then the fourth question will be, how? How can I accomplish that task? So how can I basically eliminate suffering? with taking away the destructive emotions, right? So that's the most, for us, one of the most important aspects of, of the part, right? how to progress. Yeah. So that means that it is possible by generating constructive way of thinking. Yeah. That because these destructive emotions can be taken away, as we saw, it's now just a matter of fact of getting the right methods together, or techniques together, right? So that's with the, the fourth noble truth of the true parts. Yeah. These are very simplified. In the real Buddhist context, you say you need to kind of direct perception of emptiness. But then people ask me the question, what is emptiness? So we're going to talk about it today a little bit, you know, because the subject is two truths. Right? So, yeah, so that's um, a little bit introduction. As the Buddha said, moved out of compassion, you will eliminate wrong views. Yeah? The praise of Nagarjuna moved out of compassion because the Buddha saw this kind of suffering, right, himself. Yes, we just, just described. And then he saw that he's not the only one. Yeah, we all have the same wish, wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. So based on that understanding, he generated kind of compassion for others. That others actually have this the same innate wish of wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. Like we have, when we wake up and have a headache, we want to get rid of it, right? So that wish of wanting happiness exists in all of us, very strong. And that's ego in all of us, right? So, that being the equal in all of us, then the Buddha came slowly understanding this aspect as well, and then generated kind of compassion, right? The wish for others to be free of suffering. Yeah. And then uh, engaged even more in meditative kind of practices, yeah. and then was able to eliminate all these destructive emotions. And then he, he had this kind of motivation of loving kindness, compassion, all the way up to what we call bodhicitta, <coughs> a mind that wishes all sentient beings to be free of suffering, and for that purpose likes to accomplish a higher state of mental development, what we call enlightenment. Right? So that uh, the Buddha accomplished that, and then he started teaching. So, so the Buddha initially started contemplating the things with accordance to what we just explained, then out of compassion he, he taught. Yeah? And then it says, the second line in this quotation of Nagarjuna, uh, you eliminate wrong views. So the Buddha didn't tell people, you wrong, you wrong, you wrong, you wrong, you're right. <laughs> Not like that. Eliminating wrong views, meaning the wrong views in our minds, right? Not individuals. Not kind of uh, say some people are right and some people are wrong. But we have a lot of wrong views in our own minds, right? So these destructive emotions, for example, are wrong views in a certain aspects. It's not really, yeah, I have to be very careful because if my classmates sit here and I make it so simplified, then they will debate me straight away after. <laughs> but uh, yeah, to start it's very simple. You know? So, uh, so yeah. So then the Buddha said, eliminating wrong views, you will eliminate wrong views in his praise. That means by depending on the Buddha's insight or this kind of you know, Buddha mind science, Buddhist mind science, basically that's what it is, right? If you study the psychology in Buddhism, this is it's like it's very similar to Western. Certain Western forms of, 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 of mind trainings or, or emotional intelligence, right? So it's a kind of mind science. 
So that's why Zonis Dalai Lama also says Buddhism, you can actually divide into twofold categories. You know? So Buddhism, you can see it as a, as a mind science or the psychology aspect of it, right? So it can be studied by Buddhist or non Buddhist or, or on the universal or the second level, right? So that's Buddhist kind of mind science or psychology. Then the second level is the Buddhist philosophy, right? Same thing, by thinking. Like main, if you talk with the, with the people, even the mainstream science in the, in the, in the physicists, you know, the physicists, same thing, especially on, on, in quantum mechanics, they come to a conclusion, but eventually they don't know what's going on, so they have to make a decision, what's going on, and that becomes kind of a philosophy, right? So you can see that in many conferences or conclusions of, of you know, people in the in the in the who write about quantum, quantum mechanics, the one of most books. One of the last chapters is more philosophical. It's kind of how can we describe, how can we understand what we are perceiving? How can we understand uh, the things we are examining? So then this Buddhist aspect also has kind of philosophy, right? So there's the Buddhist philosophy. Yeah? So we have Buddhist mind science, Buddhist philosophy. So this philosophy also is kind of, uh, yeah, can be studied by those who are, uh, those who are, non-Buddhist or Buddhist, yeah, so that is kind of a secular or universal aspect of Buddhist philosophy. So that's the two things this Holy Dalai Lama puts forward now, now so a few books have been uh, in the process of translating in Tibet, they are written, to, to, yeah, to give these kind of approaches of, of, of the Buddhist teachings for a secular or universal goal in society, right, the Buddhist mind science, yeah, it's not that I'm selling here Buddhism, but it's kind of having, because I did, you know, I have a degree in hydrology, but it's very kind of scientific, mathematics, statistics, so I have a little bit of background of the scientific kind of world. But if you read these kind of things in, in Buddhist psychology and, and, and Buddhist philosophy, it's, it's very deep, you know, it's so it has probably a lot of things to offer. So that's why His Holiness Dalai Lama tries to build a bridge between the Western world and, and ancient Indian kind of forms of philosophy or mind science, right? So that's why uh, it's very interesting to see the developments among the you know, scientific world engaging with the, with the Buddhist aspect of science and philosophy. So there's just two aspects there. And then the third one is the Buddhist practice. Yeah, so that's for the more people who are more interested, you know, to, to go into uh, uh, yeah, pr practice all the way up to liberation and enlightenment, right? So and initially I said we have the motivations of you know, secular one or Buddhist motivation of precious human rebirth, uh, liberation and enlightenment, you know. So those three are basically the Buddhist interpretations of Buddhist motivation. Yeah, yeah so that's are the four noble truths, right? The truth of suffering, yeah, as we explained. And then uh, we saw this, the, the physical and mental aspects and then the cause of suffering, as we saw the destructive emotions and their, re and their actions, right? So afflictions and karma, right? and then the third noble truth we saw that there's a possibility of um, yeah get rid of these kind of problems. There's a possibility of what we call cessation. Right? There's a possibility of an absence of these destructive emotions. Right? So that's um, number three, and number four was the part, right? How to get to that stage beyond afflictions. So that's kind of the very very brief the four noble truths, so to say. Yeah. So, and that depends on the two truths. Yeah. That's our, actually our subject of today. Yeah. The conventional truth and the ultimate truth. Yeah. So uh, those two truths explain us how to understand our conventional reality and the ultimate reality. It's two levels. Yeah. So with these four noble truths, up to we discuss now, the conventional reality is, is, is mainly explained from that context, right? How are the destructive emotions like anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, anxiety and fear actually how they causing suffering, right? So we discussed that a little bit. And we saw they're not in a part of the mind, they are changeable, right? They're not in concert with reality. Yeah. So that's a very important conclusion as well. They're not in concert with reality. So that means with understanding reality, we can correct it. Yeah, many things in life, we, we believe it's true, but actually, it's maybe not. Yeah. 
So, for example, a dream consciousness, we all believe it's true, you know? So it has uh, was something on the BBC News that uh, a woman who was dreaming, she had a very expensive ring, made out of gold and with a diamond, I believe. And then she was dreaming, there was, she was in a train, there was a robbery, that she was dreaming, in the dream she was so afraid that the thieves will take her ring, right? So she took, in the dream, she took out her ring and swallowed it. You know? so, <laughs> so, because she believed, it's true, so she acted in a physical way, right? So then she woke up and then she couldn't find her ring. And then, then she remembered the dream and then she went to the hospital and took a photograph and there was the ring. Right? So, she had that <laughs> so that means uh, whatever appears to our mind is not always reality, right? So she believed so much, or well, sometimes we have a disturbing dream, yeah? And we wake up and still our mind is a bit kind of half asleep, half awake and, you know, we still believe it's true, but actually it takes us time to wash our face, have something to drink and think, oh, uh, this is a dream, relax, you know. <laughs> so it takes us some time by the power of reasoning to prove that what appears to us and still is appearing a little bit is not reality. You see that? So we use kind of reasoning to prove that. You know? Or uh, traveling in the train. When what you see it with eye, eyes, you see a movement, right? And you think your your train is moving, but actually it's the other one. You know that feeling? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so at that time you think, oh, you're moving. You think that, and you believe that, until you look at a platform and you see actually the platform is still here. So that means the other train is moving, right? But you believe that's true at that time. But as soon as you saw the platform, you have the reasoning and say, okay, we're not moving because by the power of reasoning you see actually. Is not reality, right? So that kind of reasoning we can use to oppose these kind of destructive emotions, because those destructive emotions are also not, they're not in concept reality, as we saw, right? Anger overestimates the faults, attachment overestimates the qualities, right? Anger wants to be separated from its object, attachment wants to be always with its object. Yeah. So with understanding reality, we can correct it. Yeah. So then reality also comes into the picture, the importance of, of, of reality. Yeah. So that's what the Buddha said, you, so moved out of compassion, right, that's the first line uh, of the praise, you eliminate wrong views, right? So then, meaning the Buddha understood these wrong views of the destructive emotions and its root of it, you know, which is called ignorance, we're going to talk about. You know. So then he saw, by the power of that, aspect of misunderstanding reality, that's where our wrong views, we create these problems. Right? So that's why you said you who eliminate wrong views. Right? And then the third line reads like teacher of the sublime Dharma. Yeah. Dharma means kind of a Sanskrit term for phenomena or you can translate it or you can translate it as, as giving refuge, giving a safe direction. The Buddha Dharma or the teachings of the Buddha is actually giving us a safe direction. So for those who are Buddhists, it's not like, you know, the image of the Buddha is the most important thing in life. It's not like that. You know? If you take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha, the real refuge is the Dharma, is the teachings. Because the real refuge is actually these teachings that's going to change your mind, right? Yeah, so that's why the real teachings of the Buddha is the, the is actual refuge. Yeah. Of course, the real actual refuge is to have the realizations of those teachings in your mind stream, yeah, like uh, the truth of cessation and the true paths for, for an actual Buddhist. Yeah. So uh, then you can see the real refuge in that regard is the safe direction. Yeah. So that's why, uh, yeah, that's what the Buddha came to the conclusion that, uh, yeah, eliminating wrong views. What kind of wrong views? Of the destructive emotions. You teaching the sublime Dharma. Yeah, so what is actually real sublime in all those teachings of the Buddha? Yeah, so what Nagarjuna praised here uh, in this particular line, you teaching the sublime Dharma, is a, the Dharma of depending origination or interdependence. Right? So this law of interdependence or depending origination is a very important aspect of the conventional truth. Right? Knowing and understanding that things come about by the power of cause and conditions. Yeah, that's one level of dependent origination, so to say. Because if you understand things are come about by the power of cause and conditions, 
then it helps us a lot better to understand reality yeah. and it helps us a lot to understand these kind of destructive emotions also come about by the power of cause and conditions right. and another aspect of this dependent origination helps us to break down kind of concrete appearances yeah. things appear to us very innate concrete from the own side our own problems they look so huge and they look so big and they look unchangeable and it looks like we're the only one who has them you know so it's always kind of very concrete aspect of reality that appears to our mind right but the question is it's not what ever appears to our mind is not reality as we saw so the question is is this concrete appearance of our problems or, or things in life is it actually true or not right? so then the buddha actually said nothing exists from its own side but things are in the nature of interdependence yeah, so that's why the buddha taught this kind of law of dependent origination anyway later, later today we're going to talk about the different levels of dependent origination but for the time being it's kind of the interruption to that so that means that this conventional reality or the conventional truth is this one aspect is this kind of momentary changing nature of cause and effect relationships so if you have a good understanding of that aspect of reality, it will bring great benefit because all the problems we see as very concrete, existing from its own side, actually don't exist the way that appears. Right. Yeah. So and also our own minds, we're not innate bad or good or one or the other. Also our own mind is changeable, right? Even the best, uh, you know, person has, has you know, in, in ordinary life has a few. You know things to improve still and the worst criminal also has kind of possibilities to improve right yeah so when i was reading because i was involved in this uh, center prison in in, in in bangalore it's very funny because it's a real indian prison i tell you when we went inside there was the first room we went in there was no computer it was just books you know people writing books like the old stuff and then they had a blackboard you know on the wall and then they had you know amount of prisoners and for which sentence they are and, and then on top of that we were giving a kind of because it's still from the british time i think the stamps were very very popular in the early days so in india it's still the stamping aspect is, is disappearing now but uh, it's still quite evident in different places especially in the government kind of offices so then we were given kind of a stamp like this size on our left uh, low arm so that means that you can go out of the prison again after the visit, right? <laughs> so uh, the first time I went, I was a bit scary because I thought, you know, Indian prison. <coughs> you know, like, people, yeah, I had a little bit of the wrong, uh, strange idea. But actually, being in there, there's a few doors we had to go through. But then inside was like, what, what struck me was a very peaceful atmosphere for prison, you know. Police in the, in the West, an average prison in the West, people with heavy armed policemen around. There, the police inside, inside the actual prison itself, I didn't see armed police, only a stick. <laughs> it's very interesting. So, yeah, anyway, so yeah, that's a kind of experience to go in there. But then you can see that even my friend who commit, is there for murder and a few other ones that commit all kinds of crimes, you know, they can change. Right? Also, I, then I start to get more interest, and that's kind of. Harbor prison in Norway, I think it is, right? That's where they <coughs> treat the inmates completely different than the, the traditional way of the local approach. So then, it's very interesting what they accomplished is then, from the people who go back to society, they only have 20% of the criminals who fall back to the old habits. habits. Well, in the UK, it's 50 to 60%. In America, it's like 60 to 70%. You know? So that means, if you have just a lockup system, then of course they will, they will not change their minds, right? It's very difficult. But if you if you treat them as human beings and, and you you deal and you train them with yoga and kind of secular aspects of mind training, you can do something, right? So that's been accomplished in this prison in Norway. Very interesting. So it means that we can change. The mind is changeable. Yeah, so that's very important to know. Yeah. So the Buddha said. So Nagarjuna said, Buddha, you know, uh, you teaching of the sublime down. This this kind of why. Is this teaching of dependent origination so sublime and so of great, you know, value? Because that teaching of dependent origination, that teaching of the conventional truth, 
helps us to understand reality. Right? If you understand reality much more, then the, the problems will get less. Because our minds, destructive emotions, are not in constant reality, so that has to be taken care of. Right? So the same with the train, <coughs> same with the train example. Yeah? So there's many aspects that how we see things very concrete, existing from its own side, but actually things don't exist the way it appears. So that aspect should be understood. Yeah. You were teaching on sublime drama. So that's the that's second line, right? I'm sorry, third line, yeah? Moved out of compassion was the first one. You eliminate wrong views was the second one. And the third line, you teacher of the sublime drama, right? To go down food and pay homage. So that's kind of a quotation of Nagarjuna. Yeah. So, but the same way, the Buddha himself, when he taught, same thing as we just read, you know, do not commit non-virtue, uh, practice virtue, subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Yeah. So that's kind of also a summary of this same kind of context that we just read in, in, in the prayer. Means, do not commit non-virtue. Non-virtue is being classified as that which produces suffering. Yeah. It's kind of negative deeds. So, for example, everything that is motivated by the destructive emotions, anger, <coughs> you know, attachment, jealousy, pride, we act, you know, physically or verbally. We say something, physically do something. So that can be positive or negative, depends on our motivation. Yeah, so that's why we started with the motivation, because motivation is very essential. Because based on our intention or our motivation, we act physically or verbally, right? Yeah, so that's uh, an important aspect of the Buddhist teaching. So that's also here, uh, the Buddha said, if you motivate yourself for a particular purpose, try to motivate you the best way you can. That's a very important aspect. Because it's whatever we think, whatever we physically do or, or, or talk about, we always have a particular intention. I, now I do it like this, now I do it like that. Yeah, we think about things. Though sometimes very short, but we do that. Yeah? So that means that the more we understand how to direct our behavior, in a particular way, then uh, we, we know that comes from kind of mental training. Right? So that's why the Buddha spent so much time on, on the mental as, as aspect. And so, yeah, so that's a little bit of introduction of the first step. Yeah? So uh, then do not commit non virtue because negative deeds cause suffering. Right? If you do something wrong, like my friend in prison, he commit an act of murder based on a destructive emotion like anger, it causes a few minutes of disturbance to stay in prison for years, right? Yeah. And and the harm he did to somebody else. Yeah. So so that's kind of cause and effect relationship. Yeah, nothing ex nothing nothing happens randomly in, in Buddhism. Yeah. So uh, and then practice virtue, if you generate constructive emotions, then there's possibility for happiness, right? Constructive way of thinking, constructive way of moving forward, like loving kindness, compassion. <coughs> that's why I Leeds was now the compassion city, is it? Yeah. So, why does a big city like Leeds think about these things? Because they've seen from scientific research that this kind of constructive way of thinking benefits individuals and benefits society. So that's why people are interested in these kind of matters, right? So that kind of constructive compassion training or the different levels of, of generating compassion, right, or different types of compassion, it seems to have impact in a very positive way on individuals, which reflects in society. Right? So that's why it's kind of... So that's what the Buddha said, you know. You don't engage in negative states of mind, but you generate constructive, positive states of mind. Right? So if you do those two, yeah, those two, you accomplish two aims in life. Yeah? We have two aims in life, wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. Right? We started with today. So then if you practice those two, aspects of do not commit non-virtue, practice virtue, then you slowly accomplish those aims. You know, so that's what the Buddha actually said, but after he found all these aspects of the mind. Yeah. And then subdue your mind thoroughly, that's completely get rid of all the afflictions. That goes a little bit step further. Yeah. So that's, we have to go into what's called, what is ignorance. Because all those destructive emotions, as we just discussed, yeah, they rooted. The, we in Buddhists, we always ask another question. We were never satisfied with an answer. 
you know, when we, when you, I don't know if you see, if you seen videos or something, of the monks clapping their hands, you know? not like, not, not like that, but like that, you know, it's like yeah, a debate. Yeah, yeah. You know? So <laughs> then you see that in the monastic system, where I spent like two decades, more than two decades, it's like the, there's a lot of emphasis is on analyzing if it's true or not and why, you know. So what I say here also, you shouldn't just say, oh yeah. This person studied for so long, you should know, so it's all right. <laughs> you shouldn't think like that, you know, because in the monastic system also, every time we have to question things. Even the teachers in the monastic system, there's no book on the table, you know, and then they just ask us the question, where are you in debate? And we explain the subject, and then they start debating us. You know, how do we think if this sticks together? How, what is the meaning of this? Then we reply, and then the teacher will reply to us. And then the teacher said, okay, what is your interpretation of this then? And then we give an interpretation. And then he said, are you sure? And then we say, yes. Are you really sure? I say, yes. Okay. And he said, you're going to lose. And then he starts <laughs> debating us to analyze uh, these aspects of reality. Right? So that's a very important aspect. Yeah. So <coughs> this analyzing aspect is extremely important, especially when we're going to talk about the ultimate truth yeah. later on today. So at, at now we mainly talked about conventional aspects. Of reality, but it's extremely important to understand ultimate truth. I don't know how we do with time. Uh, I don't know what time we're going to break. You just just over an hour. No. Is the clock here? No. The black thing. This? No, it is. Oh, right. Glasses. Glasses. <laughs> because we go until. Well, uh, I don't know. If we, yeah, probably have break quite soon, and then I don't know. Sure. another one hour, and then lunch. Is that yeah, sure. Okay. What last time? Yeah, you have a particular time? Maybe one o'clock? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so then, yeah, maybe that's a perfect, perfect timing, then. Yeah? <laughs> now the clock. <laughs> <laughs> so then, yeah, there's a little bit of introduction, then after you have a break. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. To drink. But if there are any questions up till here, then feel free to ask. Question now? Yeah. 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 When, when you say, like, uh, when the Buddha was examining negative emotions, because uh, you gave an example of clouds appearing and disappearing in the sky, but then negative emotions are anger coming and going, is that, would you say that's proof, therefore, that they can be removed? There's one, one, one of them. There's many reasons, right? Yeah, so because it's impermanent. Because it's in the nature of cause and conditions. So mm. it comes about by depending on cause and conditions. Mm. So you can play with those causes and conditions, right? So the, 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 that anger is destructive, that nature, right? As anger comes into being, that causes suffering, that nature we cannot change. Right? Same as when we produce more CO2 in the atmosphere, then the planet will get warmer. Right? So that aspect of more CO2 in the atmosphere and getting warmer, that law of causality we cannot change. Right? That's the nature. But we can prevent from producing more CO2 in the atmosphere. Right? So with destructive emotions like anger, same thing. It causes suffering, and that it causes suffering. That's a law of nature we cannot change, but we can prevent it from coming into being, you know, or at least reduce the intensity of it initially, and then slowly, slowly build it up. So that's possible. Because, because one of the reason it's not an innate part of the mind. Mm -hmm. If anger was an innate part of the mind, then how hard you work, you would never be able to get rid of it, right? So then things you say like matter, you can get rid of it because it's impermanent. That doesn't work, does it? Matter? Yeah, mm -hmm. you say something like matter, yeah. that's impermanent. Yeah, I mean, this table I can break down and then smash it against the wall, it's not a table anymore. But that wood is still wood, that I cannot change, right? Yeah. 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 But I can play with conditions. You know? okay. So that's with anger, same thing. It's like, it's not always present, there's one reason, right? Another reason, uh, that we're going to talk about later, is that it's not according to reality, and with the correct understanding of reality, you can eliminate it. You know? That's because anger uses the same thing. This person or the situation is bad because of this, 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 this. Right? But in a few split seconds, we reason. But it's not all, all very, very logical, but we, we believe it. So with, with constructive thinking, we can oppose it and prevent it from happening. So that observance of it arising and ceasing means... Yeah, know, first getting kind of, kind of yeah. awareness. You know, so first we have to get a kind of awareness. Yeah. First kind of self-awareness, self as they call it in psychology, right? Self-awareness, then applying kind of constructive thinking, then we come to self-discipline. Yeah. 
So then, in that process, we can control the mind more. And that's what we say, subdue your mind. It's possible, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, what's more difficult to believe <laughs> initially is, uh, yes, of course, we can, uh, we can um, remove anger. Mm -hmm. It can arise temporarily, yeah. and we can remove it temporarily. Yeah. But the potential of the mind to experience anger whenever it meets with a certain yeah. condition, that seems like, you know, uh, subjectively, it seems that uh, that one doesn't change. But the Buddha is saying, even that can change, yeah. isn't it? We, we, we can yeah. create a condition in the mind where it's never going to experience anger again. Yeah. So that's a little bit different, isn't it? Yeah. It, it's a, that's it, I think it needs a bit more proof. <laughs> yeah, that needs more proof. Yeah. yeah. And that's also because there's a few aspects here, right? We have to go to that proof, we have to go, what well, we're going to talk after the break, yeah. like ignorance. Yeah. What is fueling this anger, right? If you take away the fuel for anger, then it doesn't function anymore. So then we have to talk about ignorance, right? So we're going to talk about after the break, what is ignorance? And what is the antidote to its ignorance? Yeah. It's grasping a true, complete, you know, concrete existence. If you take that away, then there's no building blocks for the destructive emotions, right? Because, as His Holiness recently starts to say, if you think about emptiness like 16 times a day or something like that, and then if you have a mind like His Holiness, of course, it's a <laughs> different story, but then His Holiness says, it looks like afflictions don't come up anymore. A very interesting comment, you know? It's a lagging, sorry. <laughs> After the break. Yeah. No, 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 <laughs> joking. So, no, it means that if you understand emptiness, you know, and you think about emptiness again and again, then these concrete aspects of how things appear to us, they disappear. If the concrete aspects of how things appear to us disappear, then these emotions like anger, touch, they don't have these kind of concrete building blocks anymore. And they just cannot, cannot manifest, right? So that's a kind of temporary. And then if you habituate your mind to this ultimate nature of reality on a very long period of time, then your mind gets so habituated, then after the meditation things appear concrete, but actually straight away you see it's just an illusion. At that time anger doesn't come, that manifests anymore, right? So then, slowly, after a long period of time, you get even rid of these kind of seeds of the anger, right? And then you can achieve what we call nirvana. Yeah, that's kind of a permanent state in the sense of ne anger never arises anymore. Yeah. Because there's no seeds, there's no cause for anger to arise. Even if the external conditions are there as before, but that's what Shanti Deva said, right? If the whole world is covered in thorns, yeah, and you want to walk peacefully, you know, without hurting your foot, feet, you know, you can do two things. You can cover the whole world in leather, you know, which is impossible. Which means we can net never, if we escape one difficult situation or a difficult person, another situation person will pop up. Everywhere, you know, it's, we cannot escape that. But if you cover your feet, meaning if you train your mind, then it doesn't matter what condition you meet anymore. Right? Yeah. So that's yeah, that needs a little bit more explanation. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah because then we have to understand ignorance and what is ignorance, and yeah, we will explain that after the break. Yeah, introduction, because then we move up to ultimate nature of reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, people have a break then, maybe 15 minutes is okay? Okay. So we meet again at 12. Okay. Go into this clock.